Okay, good morning, everyone. Okay, as we have before, that today is the uh, guest lecture section because of some of material have delivered about marketing concept, segmenting, targeting, and positioning, and also marketing mix. And all of material will be implemented in uh, your project, yeah? Uh, who are here, uh, class of consumer behavior? Okay, so after section, I would like to tell you about the, what the project that will be uh, implemented in the vinyl exam. And for a student of marketing class who have pitching with me, how many groups? Okay, you have already finished, okay? Who will schedule on this week? Propose before? Okay. Uh, so, uh, in this one, we would like to share about the inside digital economy perspective, yeah? Digital economy, how it influenced the uh, business sector. So, what the correlation with the marketing strategy or marketing uh, tactic? So we would like to uh, invite Mr. Professor Reed, yeah, Michael Reed. He come from uh, University of Kentucky, USA, and we invite him to giving a special class for you, the student of business admin. So we know that nowadays the digital economy is vesting the world of business. So what the contents, digital economy, and relevances with our business, we would like to invite him to tell us how the implementation in digital economy era. So please welcome Mr. Fred to uh, giving a speech, special speech for our student. Applause for Mr. Fred. Okay, Mr. Reed, you can use one. Yeah. Is it on? Okay. So I stand here because it's Zoom, right? Yeah. So I stand where you were? Okay. All right. So it's very nice to, to be here uh, in uh, Bandung. I guess we're in Bandung. I was in Bandung la last night and came here. So uh, it's very nice. It's the first time I've been to this part of your campus and to see so many uh, young smiling faces so it's very good and so i'm going to i'm going to talk a little bit about digital aspects of from from an economic perspective and then get into digital marketing a little bit later on uh, as i told your instructor uh, in terms of digital marketing my son who that's his full-time job he knows a lot more about that than i do and my granddaughter who's about your age is studying strategic Okay, go ahead. So it's the use of information technology, IT, to create, market, and consume goods. So it's all encompassing with respect to the economy. If you go back uh, 30 or 40 years ago when 
much less digital. Uh, everything is, is different. It's, con it's throughout our economy, your, your economy too. In fact, in many ways, the digital economy is more important in Indonesia than it is in the U.S. because you've because you've leapfrogged some of the some of the uh, assets that are not digitally oriented that are in form for in the United States. So you take advantage of mobile internet, powerful and cheap computing, small and inexpensive sensors that uh, at large scale data storage, artificial intelligence, machine learning. So, so for instance, automobiles in the United States are, have uh, hundreds of sensors and, and uh, mobile devices in there that change the way people drive. So as I'm driving down, and we, we drive a lot like you in Indonesia, we drive long distances. Uh, fortunately, our traffic in many cities is not like Bandun, but the, ca the car will has cameras, it has sensors, it will track, it has radar, so that the car that, that my wife drives and that I drive will sense how f close the car is, sense to have a camera to sense where you are in the lane, it will sense backup camera and so on, all standard equipment in cars today. So that basically if I get on the highway using her car, I can press cruise control and put on an automatic pilot so that it's basically an autonomous car. Now I need to be there just in case systems fail, but if the car in front of me uh, stops, my car will stop. So that very different than it was even 15, 10 or 15 years ago. And because of the information that's been collected on people, at least in the United States, for decades, it allows the, the consumers to have the products uh, specifically targeted towards them. So for many years, companies would collect data on people, on their consumption pattern, and give people a discount for that. And they kept that data, but it hasn't been until the last 10 or 15 years where they could really use it. It was such a large amount of data. They couldn't store it, they couldn't access it easily, and they certainly couldn't analyze it. But now computer capacity, storage capacity, makes it so that they can use that and then target things. So when I go to the grocery store and scan, I get special items for sale, a special discount for me, but I'm giving my information to that retailer. That retailer uses it in the mail every month. We get special coupons that are only for us to encourage us then to use the store and also to, again, give my data to them in that way. So customization of products is very big. Go ahead. Next slide. So. Uh, social networks, of course, allow you to keep in touch with people, but it also allows uh, companies to to uh, have digital platforms to come up and match buyers and sellers. So uh, the whole idea that your phone has all these capabilities allows, yes, you to be connected, but it also allows companies to connect in and understand what you're doing, what you're buying, where you are, and other preferences that you have, whether or not you know it. So, uh, and there are security systems that can give remote, uh, can, can keep track of uh, remote devices to understand where you are. And so uh, if, you, if you're a robber and you had your cell phone in the court case, the government, at least in the United States, can access where you were from the, uh, phone service that you have, and you say, well, I wasn't there. I wasn't even there where that robbery took place. But the phone service would know that, in fact, because of the GPS pack tracker, you were there. What were you doing there? You're, you're in trouble. Now, for us who don't ever break the law, it's no big deal. But for the criminals, it, it's, uh, it, it can help in their conviction. 
There are apps that allow you to purchase goods and services as you're walking along the street. You can have your online order to, uh, to get food, to get other items that you can collect, that you can have presented to your, to your uh, home, delivered, and, and so on. So it could involve goods, services. You could line up with someone to come and paint your house, and so on, transportation. So many years ago, and, and all this has to encompass everybody. This, the digital economy has pulled you as consumers in there to allow you to get what you want. But it's also allowed suppliers, service suppliers, good suppliers, to present their items to you consumers in a very inexpensive way through websites that they have and other ways that they have of, of generating content that can get to you through your social media platforms and other things. You can price comparison website sites just like that. You can make, uh, so, so if I'm gonna buy a ticket to, the, to Indonesia, I can go on a website and get bids that I can say, I wanna go in the next five days, and I could say, I want these airlines, I want this route, and it will, the algorithm will allow me to, to have a listing of all these displays that have prices and that have easily get me to a website. So it's a comparison website. It gets money for selling its access and then getting you to the actual website that can generate and sell the ticket to you. So it, makes, it gives you as consumers a whole lot more power, but it also gives companies a lot more access to you for a small amount of money. And we'll talk about that here in later on. So there's translation software, there's drones, there's virtual assistants, self-driving cars. So every, every day, well, every Friday, um, I work at a pantry, a food pantry in my, at my church. And so at the food pantry, people come in, they've registered with the pantry, they have low income, they have needs, they can get food, and so we check them in and so on. But oftentimes, uh, my community has a lot of immigrants. Some of those immigrants can't speak English. So as little as five years ago, I wouldn't be able to communicate with them, or I would use maybe a dictionary, but so this one's Arabic, this one's Spanish, this one is French from Congo or someplace. So, but now all I have to do is get on my, my phone, Google Translate, and I can get the phrase either writing it with my slow fingers. You're all very much faster than I am in your typing, I'm sure. But if I can do it that way, or I can press listen, use a voice command and get it that way. So it makes things very easy for me and for them too. So there's no misunderstanding about what's going on. Of course, if you, drones can be, are used for all sorts of things. Of course, they're using uh, digital networks in order to make them go. Next slide. So platforms are pervasive, and, that, and that's a major part of the digital economy, and that, as marketing people, is going to be how you uh, possibly will access the consumer. So it's an easy, low-cost way to match buyers and sellers. So you could be uh, across the, the uh, United States, you could be across Indonesia, and you could have access, if you're selling an item, you can have access to any buyer within that has access to that network. And uh, if it, it could be a worldwide network. Uh, so it's easy access, low cost entry. It can introduce new market players, for instance, suppliers of services. So we have Uber, you have what? Gojek, yes, yeah. So. What does that do? Gojek allows you to use, basically, hire for a service, in that case, transportation, very quickly on an app. Uh, otherwise, 
in the United States sometimes, and I'm sure in Jakarta. I can remember one time in Jakarta, I wanted to go to the airport from downtown Jakarta. And the traffic was horrible, horrible, horrible. Well, I had to wait until a tab would come, a taxi would come. I didn't have a phone that was a smartphone. This was maybe 20 years ago. I waited, I waited, I waited, I waited. So finally, somebody dropped somebody off on a motorcycle. I said, can you take me to the airport? I've got to get there. That was the only way I got to the airport. And so I held my bag on the back of a motorcycle <laughs> and went. Now, of course, if I want to go, if I want a motorcycle, I could order it online, of course. I could order a taxi and so on. Uh, so it allows much better access. I get a connection, at least in the United States, through Uber or Lyft that says I'm going to get that ride for this amount. Everything is negotiated and and I'm sure that it's going to come and collect me, rather than have the flashing light out there in the olden days where if it wants to, if, if it looks at you and says, I don't want to take that person, they go on. So it's disrupted things a lot. Airbnb, you know Airbnb? Yeah, so, so when we go on vacation, we just came back, my wife and I just came back from vacation in the northern part of New York where the trees were changing. It's fall in the United States. The change, trees are changing colors and they're dropping. It was very beautiful. So when we go to a place like that, we never stay in a hotel anymore. We stay in an Airbnb because it has the services that we want, which is a place for my wife to cook, a place that is quiet, it's unique, and it has exactly the characteristics that she was looking for when she made the reservation. Now, it might not be completely as, as booked, but there's really no question as to about what those products are that are being offered. And um, so I can, we can also look at ratings to see how the ratings are for those things. Um, I had a PhD student maybe about six or seven years ago did a machine learning analysis of Airbnb ratings. That was very interesting. So he was able to get that rating system for the various characteristics that are rated on Airbnb, scrape it, use machine learning and various very sophisticated data analysis techniques to come up with uh, ideas for how consumer ratings are related to overall satisfaction and prices of Airbnb offerings in Boston, Massachusetts. So it's a very highly cited but very uh, unique, at that time, seven years ago, uh, borderline sort of frontier analysis using machine learning and this concept of Airbnb. So it, lose, it improves resource allocation because people can can rent out their spare room, they can, they can uh, use their car as a resource, as an Uber driver or a Lyft driver. So many people that are using that have a little bit of time. They might have a full-time job, but on weekends, they just like to drive around. Well, they drive around and get money from that and providing a service for someone who needs it. So it's very, very efficient. And again, makes transactions easier for both sides. Facebook Marketplace is an interesting uh, aspect too, at least in the United States. So I have apartments that I rent out to students. And many, when I, I bought the first one for my daughter in 19, this, this dates me a little bit, but you probably know I'm not a spring chicken as we say in the United States, I'm a little bit older. Uh, so in 1994, when I purchased it for my daughter, who just turned 50 this past weekend, the and, and then she left. She graduated. Then I, would, I thought I would sell it. But I did, I'm an economist. I did the mathematics. And I said, oh, I shouldn't sell this. I should buy another. And so at that time, though, the point is, how did I advertise? I advertised in the school newspaper. It was very easy. 
all the students at that time, the newspaper comes out every day. I just had to advertise for about a week, and I will have access to many, many students. I will be able to rent the apartment. Well, about 15 years ago, nobody reads the school newspaper. They don't, they don't do anything like that. And so I went to another online marketplace that's called Craigslist. Have you heard of Craigslist? Craigslist has offerings of all sorts of things for sale, including sale of houses, rental of things, and people used Craigslist at that time. But about five years ago, no, there was trouble with Craigslist. It's, not, it's, it's really not a reliable way to rent anymore. Uh, now it's Facebook. Facebook is how you sell items uh, most efficiently. And so it makes it, that's how you advertise if you're smart through for young people especially. So high returns to scale and when, because of these, these platforms, high returns to scale meaning that it costs maybe a lot of money to implement them, but the marginal cost of an extra user is actually negative. It doesn't cost, having another user doesn't cost because if, let's see, if you come to my platform, uh, you don't cost anything, but you give me more revenue because you give me access to yourself and you help me out. So actually I should encourage, I should pay you to become a user, but I don't. I, but you're increasing access into the platform benefits me as a platform owner. So it reduces prices. It can reduce prices. It can reduce transactions costs. Of course, we have to see how much competition there is to make sure that what happens with prices. It can be beneficial suppliers, but can be very disruptive to traditional firms. So of course, in the United States, if I'm a hotel owner in Boston, I don't like Airbnb regulations at all because they compete with me. I have high fixed costs. I have to have high capacity utilization. And I'm worried that all these people are using Airbnbs rather than, than, than my hotel. So it's disruptive from that point. Taxi driver, tra taxi companies in the United States used to pay a lot of money in order to get what they call the badge to operate a taxi company in a, in a city. New York City, the badge would cost $250,000 to get the right to operate a taxi company. Then Uber comes in, they don't pay anything. They don't pay anything and they don't have to have the badge. Well, why? Because they, aren't, they don't fit the definition of a taxi company. So it's disruptive in the sense that, well, the taxi companies have to then compete with that somehow. We still have taxi companies in the U.S., but the value of those badges has plummeted. So they entered into the market, they paid a lot of money, and then they've had a capital loss. They're still able to survive, but they don't cater to people who are like you, who are savvy and understand that generally the Gojek or Uber or Lyft of the world is going to provide better services at a lower price. Okay, next. But the digital economy spills into all sorts of areas. And I hope you can see this. So the digital economy, the, particularly the large scale ability to process data and store data has revolutionized gene sequencing and med medical research. So that if you are traditionally, you're trying to test for cancer drugs, I mean, how do you do that? It's a, it's an, in a way, it's a random process of suddenly, somehow, getting upon a particular compound that's effective for a particular disease. Well, how do you come up with that? Well, very difficult. You try this, you try that, you try that. But AI and machine learning can, can take characteristics of the gene and give you increase the probability that a certain compound will be helpful in curing disease or at least minimizing the symptoms. Anything that's going to move it faster in the discovery process to say that this compound should 
go into more elaborate testing is very beneficial to medical companies and drug companies because they spend a lot of money, a huge amount of money, once they try a medical compound and see that it has some efficacy to get to all the trials and all the data that they have to collect and all these uh, experiments that have to go on in order to get a drug approved. It's millions and millions and millions of dollars. And if the AI can help in that process to increase the probability that a particular compound is going to be e effective, it's, cr it's much better. Of course, nanotechnology, quantum computing, 3D printing. There's a program recently in, in, uh, in, on CBS, one of the, the uh, TV networks, showing uh, the plans for a company to 3D print a house. They already do it in the United States, but they're going to do it in Mars, the planet Mars because the only way you can't, you can't get materials, you have to use what materials are available in Mars. The only thing that's available in Mars happens to be very finely ground dust that came from rock that's been destroyed over millions and billions of years. So it's a little bit like uh, sand, a cross between sand and just a pure powder. And so what they're going to do is use laser technology and 3D printing to change that, to basically uh, uh, put the laser on that, that product that's readily available to Mars and then change it into something that's solid using the, the heating process and then use it to build buildings. It's amazing. It's amazing what can be done. So, of course, blockchain health and fitness, energy and storage systems, human equipment, monitoring, all those things can be done through the digital economy. Okay, next slide. Okay, the, the, base, the great benefits, reduce transaction costs and prices, we talked about that, increases labor markets, the, the size of the geographic market because the communications is so much easier and transportation systems are a little, bit, a little bit more efficient than they were before, too. It can be labor-saving. It can increase productivity of workers, but I'll talk a little bit more of that in, in a minute. Uh, and repetitive firm tasks through robotics can be performed much quicker. So, uh, and, the use, and it uses data to, pr to produce products that have more values to consumers. And it can dis then discriminate and have little changes in the product and cater to different classes of consumers. And if it meets the particular types of products that you like, then it's better. So my wife is so much more particular about what she gets than I do. So if we go to a store, if we go to a restaurant, we, we went to this restaurant on our way back and um, she ordered this product at a at a place, and she said, I want this, and I want this, and I want this, and I want this. I don't want this. I want this on the side. And so what she got was she got, she got exactly that. And when I went up to the counter, I ordered the same thing, but I'll take it exactly the way you do it. So, But the place now, even in a restaurant, it's, it's easier. But a company that's producing a, a good could cater to what she wants so sell it to her, get a higher value because you're manipulating it in some way to make it closer to what she, her willingness to pay. Economists talk a lot about willingness to pay. She's willing to pay more because it's produced exactly the specifications that she has. And then me, who have less taste when it comes to things, I can get a thing that's more standardized and price. Okay. That, but but what's going to happen to jobs in the future? What is this going to be creating jobs or is this going to be taking jobs away from people? Okay, next slide. Um, it probably presents problems. It it challenges economic, social, and political systems because it's so disruptive. Economic and regulatory systems because it's bringing in new players into a system that is different. 
and that, that, that they have to compete in more competition, but more competition in a different way that caters more to people who consume a lot of products, people your age and a little bit older. Social systems, political systems, uh, the fake news. I mean, there's an election coming on here in Indonesia. There's an election coming on to the U.S. next year. And the stuff you see that's supposedly news uh, is, is not true oftentimes. Well, why, how can they do that? Well, they can digitally change photographs and make it look like a, whatever they want almost. It, they can make claims on this, this digital platform that all sorts of people will look at and believe. Why do they believe it? Well, it's, it's, it's on the internet and it's by this person. Well, that doesn't mean that it's true. There's no funnel, there's no to make it, or no filter to make sure that it's, that it's true. Uh, increased inequality for job seekers, firms, and consumers. So those who are more technologically savvy in terms of companies, consumers, and job seekers will have an advantage over others. And because they can spread, they can, they can spread their market over more, they can then increase the demand for their product or the, the supply of their services and so on. So there's probably a need for regulations in terms of asymmetric power, lawsuits, and so there, I'll talk a little bit about lawsuits here later on in the presentation from the big four kind of get lawsuits from the Europeans and the U U.S. and so on. There are ethical concerns about genetic manipulations, robotics, and what they do, socialization, um, what's happening to people that, that spend the majority of their time on their phone, uh, particularly when it when you add in COVID and the whole idea of so social distancing and, and staying away from crowds, what is that doing to our societies? Privacy concerns, of course, is very, very important. So uh, how secure is the data that you have when you present that to a company? Or uh, you answer a simple survey and they can link that to whatever it is associated that the other databases have on you as a consumer. How about when you, I can look up all the tests that I had at a recent doctor visit online. I go to my university hospital. Well, someone can attack that and get all sorts of information about me personally and use it to do not so not my bank accounts and other things. So those security are very, very uh, important. And uh, identity theft is a big problem in the United States. Fake news and propaganda, social groups and concerns, a lack of interaction and group activity and can be very disruptive, again, to incumbent verbs. The next, next one. Okay, so what does this mean about people like you who are taking courses with the anticipation that you're going to have employment opportunities enhanced because of what you're learning. And in this age of social media and digital aspects of the economy, it's going to call for people that have more problem-solving skills, social and system skills, rather than physical or content skills. The reason why is, even though wages might not be that high in industries, firms tend to go towards robotics that can use, that are can, with a digital economy. So they'll use robots or other means that are not, that don't involve human interfaces. So for instance, in the United States, um, one of the supermarkets is getting, well, getting rid of the line where there's a cashier. All they do is have self-checkout. And that, of course, is, means that they won't have any cashiers around. They'll have people that keep up with things and make sure that if there's any problem with people in learning how the self-checkout works. But other than that, no people in that. They, but, well, what do, they, what do they need? They need more technology people to keep that running and to en enhance it as it changes to cater more to consumers and so on. It's technology such as... Uh, recognizing barcodes in as the 
uh, cart is moving out of the store. So that even gets rid out of the self-checkout. You don't have to scan it anymore. In the future, they'll probably go, there are stores that do that. They give you a discount for doing that. So that's another technology that would be developed that would change things too. So the technologies are always changing, but a lot of times they're leaving the human suppliers behind when it comes to that. So that means you're going to have to be more ado adoptable as, a, as an employee because things are going to change. The amount of change I've seen in my lifetime is crazy. It's just crazy. And you'll see a lot of change in your lifetime too. What that is, I don't know, but it will change because technology tends to change in a geometric rather than a linear fashion, meaning that as technology increases, the rate of change increases. It may lead to more segmented job markets with some people having very low paying jobs, very menial jobs, and other pay people being able to pay very high jobs. At least they're, 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 that's a possibility. There's some speculation that there'll be a cloud of a group of workers, basically, that are much like the Uber driver. Whereas, uh, well, for instance, my son, who's the, who is in advertising, um, he is the search engine optim senior search engine optimization person. Which you know what that means? You know what search engine optimization is? Yes? What? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What he does is basically make sure that companies uh, get on the first page of a Google search. And how do you design your website? Because Google is going to, the, the Google for, uh, the algorithm for Google for putting firms in a Google search changes all the time. Uh, and so he has to keep up and make sure that his big clients get good access on a Google page. Because the, if you're on the second page, you're going to get fewer people than you get on the first page. Third page, you're going to get lower than that. Well, part of that, part of his job then is to make sure that he, that he designs the website in such a way that it's going to do that. He is uh, thinking of... He, he needs to make his next leap because uh, he's a senior. He has a staff of people. He's the senior in this firm. It's a small firm. Has no physical presence anymore. They sold their, they, they got out of their lease because of COVID in New Orleans. And so he works from home all the time. And he wants to be, the next thing is to go to a large firm that has a digital presence and to be a manager in all that. But he doesn't know if he'd be a good manager. So what he's thinking of doing is instead going freelance and being basically a cloud worker that works on very specific products, projects for advertising company, for companies. Could be advertisers or could be directly to companies. So sort of own his own place, but work, but, but also most of his work would come from established advertising companies because they have a small, they might have a smaller staff and for particular things, they know that, ah, this person is really, really good at that. We don't have to hire them for the next 15 years. We just want to hire them for this two month project, pay them a lot of money but it's still more efficient for them to operate that way. So of course, for the, for the worker, there's a lot more risk in that. You have to continue to find clients all the time, but there's also possibly more return because as you, as you get more clients, you get a reputation and then the, the amount of money that you can make increases all the time. Well, that's a very different format than a typical advertising company or a particular person in the advertising companies. But there is still, I mean, studies have shown that there's still a need for you as an 
individual, to be part of a bigger organization, part of something that you can relate to other people. So we went to the rector's office, the rector building today, and in the rector building, there is a, it's all in Indonesian, so I don't know exactly what it said, but there are five or six things that UNPAD is known for. It is, this is what it means to be associated with UNPAD. And that brings a synergism and a meaning to all the employees, hopefully, at UNPAD. And so that's the reason why they came up with that slogan and why they want to instill that upon all the people. So there's a feeling of togetherness moving forward in the appropriate way, in a good way that's going to provide good experiences for students, generate good research, generate good services to the companies and individuals in the community too. Let's go to the next one. Okay, so who are the big players in the, what's, what's the digital economy? Uh, who are the big ones? And let's go to the next one. And uh, these are figures from last year. So the digital economy in the US accounts for $3.3 trillion of sales employs about 8 million people, accounts for 10% of the U.S. gross domestic product. According to studies, Bureau of Labor Statistics study and the Congressional Budget Office study has had, various people have had studies to come up with it because you've got to categorize various jobs to make that, to come up with those, and those are estimates. And 25% uh, of that is e-commerce, that is it sales through e-commerce network. 44% are digital services and 31% is infrastructure or the hardware and, and other supporting aspects of putting the system together. So it's big. It's big. It's getting bigger. It's employing more people. It's taking a bigger percent of the GDP of the United States. So next one. So what's the digital infrastructure? So it would include semiconductor equipment, Got these sensors, have semiconductors, computers have some, all that is going to be printing machines and machinery, computer peripherals, communication equipment, uh, all this, AV and, and so on, software publishers. So that is what constitutes that, that uh, infrastructure. Next one, next slide. E-commerce could be business to business or it could be business to consumer. That's going to be 25%. And then the last one, go ahead, next one, is digital services, which would do uh, communications, internet and data services, and cloud services. Uh, that is cloud storage and cloud access. That's the infrastructure and, and kind of how big it is. Now, let's talk a little bit about the, the four big players. But before I go there, who do you think the four big players in the digital world are? Google, yes. Facebook or Meta, Meta. Amazon, and last one. Apple is Apple. Microsoft. I don't know, but it's got to be Apple. God, Apple has to be. Let's see. So Amazon, Apple. Facebook and Google, so Microsoft isn't in there. Microsoft is a software company and not so much of an e-commerce. So those are the four big ones, and there's a concern on the part of various governments that those companies are too big. They're too big, they are too encompassing, they have too much power, uh, but that's just an extension of the, the problem that, that regulators have in general that size, as companies get bigger, we've known this for the last 30 years, as companies get bigger, they get more efficient. So there's, a, there's this trade-off between them getting bigger and having lower costs and getting bigger and having more advantages, having more market power. Uh, so you look at, at least in the developed world, in the United States and the EU, uh, they're always trying to come up with 
with regulations that try to reduce market power. But in general, the regulations in the last, well, since the Reagan administration have been more relaxed in the United States. EU has to, tends to have more um, rigorous uh, regulation of market power to reduce the size of the companies. But oftentimes, they aren't European companies. None of those are European companies. They're all U.S. companies. So the Europeans, when they're regulating and say, oh, you've got to do this and this, we're going to fine you so much, they're fining their companies. They're, conf they're fining our companies. So let's take a look at Amazon and Apple and these. So let's go to the next slide. Uh, Okay, so here's sales, of course, sales, employ the number of employees they have, their net income, and their market cap. So their market cap, of course, is their stock price times the amount of shares that they have outstanding. Now, all of those, particularly market cap, varies a lot. It just fluctuates because the stock price fluctuates so much. And to this extent, the amount of stock outstanding is a little bit different. But they're huge companies, particularly with respect to sales and market cap. So the smallest of those is Facebook. Facebook sales, $118 billion. In uh, the largest of those, Amazon, 407, almost half a trillion dollars of sales. They're huge. They are huge companies when, it's, when you're looking at sales. But if you're looking at employees, Facebook only has 84,000 employees and generates $118 billion of sales. Just phenomenal. Facebook, and, and, and a lot of that, a lot of those employees now are, are, are really uh, employed to, uh, to get at regulators and content. They have They have many, they have thousands of people that try to look at content that's posted all the time to generate, to, to look and make sure that it's um, legitimate, that it's not fake, that it's not um, vulgar, and so on. The largest of those has Amazon, 1.5 companies. They're very different companies, of course. Amazon has all sorts of things that it does. But it's basically a buy-sell platform, but it's also a delivery company, too. Face Apple has all sorts of technology products, but it's, it's a cloud computing, a, a cloud company. That is, it has a lot of storage. It has, of course, uh, computers. It has all sorts of electronic devices and so on. It has music and other things. Facebook, of course. And then Google is a search engine, but it also has other uh, cloud computing that it does also. Now, net income, Apple, $100 billion of net income. That is profit. It's the closest thing to we, what we would say is profit. $100 billion, by far the most uh, of these. And then Google at $76 billion. When these companies started off, they, were, they didn't make money for years. They lost money for a decade, each one of them. Why was that? Be especially for the platform people, you develop the platform and encourage all these costs that come up with the technology and people to make this platform happen. And you try to get those first users, they're very expensive to get. They're very expensive to get. But now new users cost them nothing and probably generate profit. Everything that they do uh, generates profit. It's much like a movie theater. You know, in a movie theater, if markets were efficient, remember I'm an economist, if markets were efficient sometimes, movie theaters should operate so that it's, that it's price for a ticket fluctuates wildly all the time. Why? Why is that? What's the marginal cost of an extra person at a movie theater? What does it cost the movie theater that has a scheduled movie 
at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. It has three people in the theater. What's the marginal cost of a person? Nothing. Zero. The platform's already established. It's already going to happen. Another consumer, all it has to do is if there's a free seat in there, it's zero. Furthermore, if that customer would come in and buy, I don't know what you eat at Jakarta or Indonesian movie theaters, but if that person buys high-priced food in order, you, you should pay them a little bit of money to come. But that sounds crazy, right? But it is. It does make sense economically. But, you know, economists have no sense, you know. But anyway. So, but the, but the key factor is in the platform, probably, the marginal, so the marginal cost of a, of a person into that theater is negative. So they should be paid some, but they aren't. Why? Because people don't like uh, movie theater tickets moving all around. They just don't like that. The companies don't like that. But really, they do try to give discounts at various times when they're not going to have as many people. They get away with that a little bit. But on the platform, it's also the same. So they lost money for years and years and years and years, these companies. Uh, these three companies in particular, one, two, three. Uh, and stockholders were patient, patient, patient. And those stockholders that bought in early have made a fortune because they make so much money now. And their market cap, Apple was the first company to go over $1 billion in, in market cap. Now they're over $2 billion. I think they're below that now. Uh, but when uh, that slide was done, it was $2.2 excuse me, trillion dollars. $2.2 trillion. It's a lot of money. OK, next. So, what are the characteristics they tend to control all aspects of the value, except hard work? Uh, so, Apple, Apple has its suppliers. It only supplies for Apple, and it controls everything from contracts all the way through. Same thing with the, the new features are important, but, but so is reducing the barrier for new or earlier for your sales and service. So, Oftentimes, they aren't giving you anything new, particularly, but they're making s existing services available to you in an easier way. They use inputs from humans with algorithms to analyze data. So they're using data to provide services and goods to you in a better way. They're contacting you, and they're giving you ads. They're giving you pushes, what we call pushes, in order to, 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 to push you into moving, to buying something or to doing something, all that. And um, you as a consumer have given them that data, but some consumers don't want to give them the data. Some consumers don't mind. Why? Because if they don't want to give it because they think it's, it's, it's maybe linking them to something that, that they don't want firms to know about. Other people say, oh, yeah, if they're going to give me all these special deals, I'll take it. More information for me is better. Uh, but of course, you don't know how private the data is that they have for other people. You know, Can you get in and, and uh, get the information that's available on Amazon somehow by attacking it? So they're using those al algorithms to analyze reams and reams and reams, unbelievable amounts of data. Unbelievable. Where I thought many years ago, why are they collecting all this data? There's no way a human being could analyze all that. Why? Well, now we know. Yes, I was right, but I was wrong. I assumed it would be humans that would do it, but it's all, of course, algorithms and and artificial intelligence, machine, machine, uh, high-powered machines doing all the, the uh, analyzing of data, and use mathematical mo models to calibrate product that consumers need to improve sales or improve offerings. Uh, so it's behavior targeting, uh, 
specialized products for people. Or it might be specialized drugs for people who don't know that they need the drug, but it develops it in that way. Go ahead, next slide. So how do they get this information? Amazon has uh, credit card information for 350 million consumers in the United States, uh, well, in the United States, including me. I mean, they, they, they probably know more about me than I do in some ways. Uh, Apple has a billion credit cards on file. Facebook has a billion viewers each day that receives our ads targeted to them. Google has a search, yes, but it also has great uh, tracking people. So, so I don't know here, but if when I was coming from Jakarta Airport to Bandung, by car, <laughs> but anyway, anyway, I wanted to see, well, am I going to get there before 6 o'clock? And this was 7 o'clock in the morning, and, and I was in Jakarta. Oh, well, what did I do? I got on my Google Maps and estimated that said, oh, calm down, only 2 hours and 45 minutes. So I go, okay. And the first thing, even to commute to work sometimes, or particularly to commute back from work, first thing you do is you do a Google Maps to see what happens to traffic and how you can get home. Well, they, they're, they're using that, that data for you. Uh, so they track people, they suggest items. Uh, I don't spend enough that they say suggest much to me, or at least I don't realize it, but yes, they can track where I am. Well, I guess they, I, I do. They say, well, where's the entrance to this place? Or how did you like this place? Or things like that. Uh, and they can, those places can give you ads associated with what specials they have at those places. Next. So, a little bit about productivity. Um, this OECD uh, study, or Organization for Economic Development, uh, did a study that looked at productivity and found a strong correlation between productivity growth and the use of data. Now, it's very challenging, use a little bit of aggregate data, but nonetheless, so there are means, but they found that they were concentrated in certain firms, of course, leading edge firm, firms that can use the, data, the information that's available. They have the capacity to track and use the data and access consumers in, and it's too for, for their products. So the firms with better technical, managerial, and organizational skill will take more advantage of it. Go ahead, next slide. Uh, well, we've gone through most of these. It can, the Productivity can allow firms to improve product design, automate routine tasks through robotics and other ways, perform tasks remotely so that you don't have so much transfer of resources or products or people between uh, places so that you can get the best talent in the world. For instance, if you're an advertising company like my son is, I mean, he gets, it doesn't matter where the people live. There's no office for his firm, they, uh, which, you, and you, as you can imagine, it has challenges, but they're virtual. They can have meetings, they can have Zoom meetings, and they can have team meetings. And uh, that way, they can get the best talent that they want, that they can afford to, to buy, to become part of their team. Might live in New York, might live in New Orleans, where the company is based, might live in Northern New York, where I was uh, last week, that looks like there's nobody up there. It's just a bunch of lakes and mountains and nice colored trees. So for, so for the big firms, that's great. But for the little firms, they can't compete then. So, so he's, he's trying to hire somebody for New Orleans Somebody in New York could hire them away just like that or offer a better salary. It makes it more efficient in sense of you as a labor supplier, if you have skills that the employer can recognize. But as a firm, your current employees are more, much more mobile 
and getting new talent can be a challenge with you. So it's just a different world out there these days. But the information supply and, and data can facilitate relationships to be between among suppliers and clients, and you can access a wider market. Okay, next. Okay, then they've got strong complementar complementarities with other other things uh, of, of particular technologies. But let's go ahead to the, the next slide. Network effects, but aren't spread equally among firms. It gives some firms competitive advantages. Uh, so you come up with these big firms that hire the best talent, and so get the become biggest, make the most most profits. But ultimately, it's very possible that the consumers are the ones that benefit because those products are offered at a lower price. Okay, next. But it's going to be, you're going to increase the disparity productivity among firms. You're going to, therefore, ages in those firms will be more diverse, dispersed, will be high income individuals. They'll be able to get jobs wherever they can, wherever they want, and they don't have to move in oftentimes, particularly if they're part of the digital economy. They can work in a rural of the, the country that is beautiful, has lower costs, and still work in New York City that has the highest salaries. There's a larger gig, gig economy where employment is less normal. Remember, there's for, for particular jobs, whether it's an Uber driver or an advertising executive that's doing a particular project for a firm that's located in Hong Kong. Uh, but oftentimes the benefits then are yeah. less. Uh, you have as a, you're more of an independent uh, contractor. So Uber drivers are independent contractors. They have no benefits. They get a wage. You have a situation where if you're a continual Uber driver, you might not have saved enough up for retirement. And the government doesn't like that. Why? Because then you become dependent on the government for your retirement. And then, you're, and then you see me when you don't have enough money to buy food. Uh, and all firms can benefit from the platforms developed by the superstar firms, uh, but they, I don't know, I just, okay. Uh, and so next. Slide. Oh, the, okay. Cyber loafing and things like that. Uh, okay, product, other product benefits. User ratings and reviews can reduce information asymmetry, asymmetries between consumers and, and suppliers. Uh, do you believe the user ratings on goods? Or Airbnb. You do. I, ha I had uh, my department chair for a while said I don't believe any of them because they can all be fake reviews. They can get, uh, but we use them all the time. And when my wife has the patience to read all those reviews, uh, me I don't have the patience. So why choose where we go? She chooses where we stay. And if there's anything that goes wrong, she gets the blame. Uh, but she reads the reviews, but do you know which ones she reads? Which ones does she read? She reads the negative ones first. Because the negative ones, if they're, the negative ones that are honest, if you've ever done, if you've ever been to a, an Airbnb and you give it a bad rating at first, before it's pub supplier will come back and say, oh, wait, can you do this? Oh, I'm going to be, oh, if I get a, oh. or can you change your rating? And so there's a human tendency, go back and say, oh, well, it's okay. You, I'll, I'll give you the break. I mean, it, you know, it was, so 
a lot of times those are over-evaluated. But the negative ones, if you're, a, if you're a user, if you're a consumer and you want to do a negative rating, the platform will allow you to do that. And so that will tell you sort of what it's like, at least in certain instances. So if somebody says, well, uh, it's on a busy street and you can't get any sleep at night, it's late, and there are all these partiers up, and you happen to be a partier, what's negative to an old person like me might be very beneficial to you. Uh, but anyway, she reads those, and the, and the idea is that those, those negative reviews are probably the ones that are most true, or at least for some individuals. Some of those review, negative reviews are, they, they, you can overcome them. And in fact, the supplier will come back and say, ah, yeah, change this, or we're sorry that this was the case, so on, and we've remedied this situation, and so on. Uh, they intensify competition and pressures by shifting demand. Uh, the Airbnb study in Boston was there were there were people that were changing their the as the characteristics of their house in order to improve their Airbnb ratings also so you can use that to uh, incentivize providing better services for for and maybe a little bit of, of money associated with it too but the fact that the, it does bring competitive behavior through those ratings to improve your product if you're lowly rated can bring efficiency gains by here are side activities, such as, uh, as managing bookings from around. Uh, you can get somebody else to do it through the digital economy and process payments, and uh, of course, improve capacity utilization better and lower prices at certain times of the year. You I mean you can lower the price on your place just like that if it's a week before and you don't have a have it uh, taken in terms of an Airbnb or something like that. Okay, now. Okay, let, let, let's go on to, that's another study. Okay, so let's talk about targeting advertising. And you might, you might know.
yeah, it gets them in their website, but Google and Facebook don't do anything once it's inside their website. They get money get you, getting you into the website, but after that, that, uh, monitor that, and he monitors that for some of his big customers. And then they can read the results feedback into future strategies. Type up individuals, so they, as soon as you click in there, they've got information about you as an individual from the, from the, the uh, uh, Google or wherever, and what did you do? What did you use? How did you, how did you respond to that? And then they can use that into, they could analyze what characteristics of people made a s purchase, what characteristics people didn't make a per purchase, and how long did they stay in there. So if there's things that get them to stay longer, how much of a payoff is there? So there are all sorts of information that's available. And there are surveys. There are also a bunch of surveys that people have access to that, uh, that uh, so, um, and I, I'm addicted to this somewhat. I get, I do these surveys uh, that look at my awareness of previews of, of uh, videos on YouTube. And, I, and what I do is I do a survey. I look at the, the survey will say, how do, you, how do you like this? What is most persuasive, this video or this video? This video or this video? What do you like? Or what, did you, what things did you watch on TV? And so what then they do is they ask you about things that were covered in the TV show. So if you answer the questions right, then they know, well, you were watching it. Then they ask you questions about the advertisements. Did you, re what's your, okay, this, ad, what's your, what went on and what was one of the advertisements? This characteristics of the ad. And did you, uh, was that a good ad? Did you like the ad? Did you not like the ad? Did you buy anything from the ad? Did you do, things like that. All that as a feedback associated to how people are using, basically looking at the advertising. It's immediate feedback. I don't get paid much for it. I guess I, my, I have a low value of certain things, but it allows me something to do as I'm waking up in the morning. I, but all that, I, I get very little money for doing that, but the companies, you know, they get some ideas about what they might, what are good advertising venues, what information is most important, and what characteristics of people like the ads but, or dislike the ads, because they've taken all sorts of demographic information on that. So Google Analytics can help the company develop this tracking system, uh, but it, co of course, costs you quite a bit of money, and it might not be quite suitable for your situation. Okay, next. Okay, so uh, digital economy is just going to be bigger and more pervasive. As people in governments need to learn how to deal with the issues that these technologies, whether it be cybersecurity or personal privacy or uh, in, uh, increased size of firms, things like that, the, the kind of the negative aspects that, that could come from it. Uh, but can, it, can technology like this feed into other changes that we have, the other problems that we have, climate change, sustainability, inequality, poverty? Can they improve? Can they detract from health? Or can they improve health? I mean, they have it probably they can have really, really positive benefits in all those areas if it's handled right, if you kind of steer it so that it, the bad parts of it are cut off and not allowed or discouraged and the good parts allowed to flourish. And can it overcome some of its negative uh, influences, which would be concentration of power in companies? 
isolation, reduced socialization, and other things associated with that. Okay, I think that's the last one. So, now it's your turn to either ask me questions or let me inform me of how things operate in Indonesia. So, anyway, thank you for, for being so attentive and and I'll answer questions or comments or anything that you have. Okay. Applause for the presentation first, of course. <laughs> Next, your turn. This one. Uh, thank you, Professor, for the opportunity that you're giving me. Uh, I want to ask you a question about an issue in our country about digital economics. So uh, I don't know if you already heard about this, but uh, recently in Indonesia, uh, our government uh, has banned the TikTok shop. So TikTok shop is uh, e-commerce that owned by TikTok. Uh, and then after that, uh, I also heard in the US uh, that their government has regulated this issue uh, because uh, they think that uh, it can threaten their uh, security, uh, national security establishment. And then I want to ask your opinion about this. Uh, do you have uh, a solution uh, due to this issue? Uh, and then because uh, you know that uh, there are many people that uh, their life is depend on the TikTok and then they got revenue from that. And then, uh, bec uh, and then they create content, and then uh, they affiliate with the program, and etc. Uh, something like that. I want to ask your opinion opinion about this band. Thank you. Very good. Um, yeah, good question. Yeah, very quite good. Very good question. Yes, uh, politics enters into things. So, uh, and in the United States, which kind of starts all this. Anything that's against China is very popular these days, with not only with the politicians, but most of the American society, mostly because they don't really quite, all these things are nuanced. And so, um, so with TikTok, there was, under the previous administration, the Trump administration, a big move to ban it. But um, it didn't get banned. Because consumers came up and, and users, I mean, people, as you said, as you so well said, that uh, people have businesses that are, that are making money on this. Most people who consume it, what, China's going to develop a nuclear strategy to attack us based on people watching little cute kid things or cat videos or something? It's just kind of beyond the realm of belief. So it's very much politics. And so it, it raises its head every once in a while in the United States. And it's banned by some uh, governments for their employees to use. But, I mean, you shouldn't be using TikTok while you're working for the government anyway. I mean, you can use that after hours. Uh, so I don't, think, I don't think there's much uh, valid in terms of now, granted, if, you're, if, you're, if you have a phone that deals with sensitive activities and maybe the information can't get back to China, then you ought to rethink that and, and you might have some restrictions on that. But most of us have no such, there's, no, there's nothing they can, the Chinese government can get uh, that's going to be that bad for most of us. And there's no clear evidence that they have the right to get that. Now, of course, this, this goes back to, to an edict that the current Chinese president had that all companies operating in China had to turn over their data to the Chinese government, not only with their operations within China, but potentially their operations outside China. But the TikTok uh, CEO for the United States says that they don't turn over the data and, and so if that's a problem, then, then attack the problem in a way that gets it to, to a solution. That is, don't allow that data to move if you can have that. Uh, but I think it, it's mostly politics. And I think 
there was enough of a consumer backlash in the United States that, we'll, that we won't have that. And maybe in Indonesia, too. Um, yeah, thanks. Thanks for the question. Very interesting. Thank you for your answer, Professor. Okay, nice insight. Next. Okay, you. Okay, thank you, sir, for the opportunity. I want to ask a question about um, I am as I'm ace in Indonesia, which there are 64.2 million in Indonesia. We already saw the example about the big companies that benefits by digital economy because of how wide their segmentation are. Not too, and not too long ago, it's uh, kind of same with the previous question. There is an issue or news about some groups of uh, MSMAs, especially who rent a place to sell their product, demonstrate how they are disadvantaged uh, by the digitalization, as we learn on final observation also. And in my opinion, uh, they think that digitalization reduces uh, the socialization. And then, um, in my opinion, this happened because of lack of knowledge of digitalization that they know. But in their opinion, I conclude that digitalization reducing a lot of jobs opportunities and their markets target. What I'm curious about, is there any gap between the digitalization and work that human can do manually? Because as, is, as example, as uh, we are students, we use chat GPT a lot for our studies, but there's a gap when we use it because GPT cannot give us detailed and exact uh, research resource of their answers, so there is a space for us to do manually. But how about the digitalization that happened uh, on our MSMS in Indonesia? Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it's interesting. For, so for instance, advertising by Amazon on, on uh, Facebook or even on TV emphasizes how they help small businesses, how they provide a platform. And so they go, they not only sell, they give an audience for the platform be, because they, they have a small business. No matter where you are, you can sell your product all sorts of places. And a lot of the people on Amazon have free shipping. I, my, we are an Amazon Prime. We can, we can buy anything from Amazon and the shipping is free. So it gives them access to places all over the place. So uh, they, they emphasize that with the whole knowledge being that they need to inform people that that's, some of this stuff is really not true. It's really not true. Uh, and, and, and so uh, I think Amazon and, and how much they pay workers. You know, what's the minimum wage at Amazon? And what are their benefits that they have? So they're, they're trying to... Uh, get this information out to consumers so that, that they know then, they have an idea that Amazon is a good employer, it's a good place to, to, to work, it treats employees well, it also uh, provides a platform for small businesses and, and so on. Uh, but, but, but I mean there are, but you're right also, they might create, they might get rid of jobs they might destroy jobs, uh, but there are other jobs that will likely, in terms of past disruptive innovations, there have always been other jobs that have been created that make up for it, or so it seems. I mean, it's hard to know exactly how much work was, was uh, created and destroyed in a particular technology, but the, the, the economy has to adapt. But it's people like you that have to adapt. And uh, in a way, um, Amazon provides a, a means whereby um, lots of people that can only work a few hours a day can go in their distribution centers around Lexington. We have students that work at night at Amazon, and, and they pick commodities out of the warehouse. Uh, and then, and, and, and so they get paid a fair amount of money, they get tuition, uh, some of their tuition paid for it, but it's not a permanent, it's a temporary job for them. It's something that they'll graduate out of. It gives them flexibility that they don't already have now, but with a high paying job, that's maybe 50% more than working at a restaurant or something like that. 
Uh, but a lot of the jobs that are destroyed by some of this technology, some of this robotic technology, is not jobs that, that you strive for anyway. Now, there are people that don't Unpod or to the universities that, that maybe want those jobs, and, but you have to, have to then, as a, as a government or as a policy-forming organization, come up with ways for them to be employed too. But you can't, you can't keep the technology pushed down just so that you keep low wage, low productivity jobs going on. Um, but, but you do want everybody to benefit in a way. And, and as I say, if I said a couple of times, uh, the gains are not equally shared among people. But you do as, a, you do as, as young people have the opportunity to make decisions that can prepare you for that by coming to UNPAD, taking particular courses, and developing generalized skills and specific skills that will make you ready for jobs now, but generalized skills that will make you also ready for jobs in 10 years hence, or 20 years hence, if you happen to be the person that, that uh, makes that change. I talk a lot about globalization. Globalization's the same way. Um, a lot of people benefit from globalization. It, now, it has a, it's a bad word these days in the United States and many places. I, it'll come back. It'll be a positive thing in five years or ten years. But right now, it's 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 sort of reached its peak as being a, a nasty term, and it's it's getting better. But uh, there are winners and losers, and the winners t tend to be people like you, the smart people that are going to school and learning skills. Uh, but you don't push back globalization in order to save. Low pro again, it's they're saving low productivity jobs in their domestic economy to prevent imports. You just don't do. You, there are lots of examples to show that, that company that countries and companies don't need to do that. Then you need to progress forward. You need to move forward, but try to as best you can to make it to, to remedy some of the, the not so good situations that develop from that. Okay, thank you. Applause for the answer. Maybe one the last student. Okay, you. Uh, good evening, sir. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, the digital economy has uh, reshaped consumer behaviors and expectations. My question is, what are the differences or transformations does it brought, and how does businesses, especially small businesses, adapt to these shifting expectations? Thank you. Uh, do you mean by go check, or do you mean by uh, ride share, or do you mean car sharing? Uh, or all of it? Like, especially like small businesses. Uh, Transportation? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I don't know. Um, small businesses and, and uh, I mean, the whole idea of, of a gig economy of potential delivery people making easier connections among small businesses so that they don't have to, usually if you go to FedEx or major companies, you have to be a relatively large company in order to get better rates. So if you go to the if you just go into a Federal Express office, that's a delivery service in the United States, and ask them, I want to ship a package from Lexington, where I live, to Boston, it will cost a fair amount of money to do that. Um, and so, well, why? Because I, I'm a nobody. I'm a small business. I only do it once, a, once every week. Uh, they don't particularly want me. But there is somewhere between the high cost that would cost a ship to through FedEx you know once or twice a week that a smaller company that could be involved gig workers that might be able to to fill that gap 
So in that way, they sort of are more flexible and they're more able to fill the niche needs, the small needs of people who get charged a lot in a traditional system uh, but still have transportation needs that could be serviced and, and used by this more flexible transportation company. Uh, I thought you meant, uh, of course, this is a big company issue when it comes to autonomous driving cars and car sharing and things like that. I think that by in your lifetime, you in, in the United States, everybody owns a car. Um, well, I see, not everybody, but almost everybody owns, owns a car. In 20 years, uh, it's likely that most people won't own a car, and they will they will use either gig providers or autonomous driving cars to get from one place to another. And so why? Because you have a system that you have a high fixed cost for, and you hardly use it. I have a, I have a, I have a 2018 Toyota Camry that uh, I use. I put maybe, let's see, in kilometers, maybe 6,000 kilometers on it per year. Why do I need it? It's sitting in my, it's sitting there most of the day. And uh, some days I don't use it at all. So, um, and to the extent that a small business would be like that too, uh, the whole idea of these other ways of providing services that are more tailored, but they're shared by other people so that someone else has made the investment, they can use it for many, many more transactions to, to share that fixed costs for many movements so that I don't have to spend $28,000 for a new car and then rarely use it. I can go uh, through a ride-shared service or for even a, the ride-share will ultimately be a self-driving car, which will, will lower the cost even more. Uh, in that, and in that way, the self-driving car can, in fact, get a route that will pick up people along the way, and so it will be a flexible, basically a flexible minibus that gets people exactly where they want to go in an optimized route that has a very low price. So that would help consumers and small businesses in terms of routing and things like that. But all that you know, the capability of doing that is available. It has been available for a long time, but the complexity of putting the system together and communicating it uh, around it is a, is a linear programming problem that's difficult. But if you have information that to communicate, this person wants to go here, this person wants to go here, and the computer can look at all those options Come up with a it, quite easily, whereas it would be a number of runs of computer model in order to do that. Crazy. So I think small businesses would benefit from that too. Okay. Thank you, sir. Applause for the answer. Okay. I guess we can conclude that the digital economy has the impact so. Various of aspect, yeah, for not only for business, all but also the politics and also with the uh, behavior of market itself. So, as a market acting student, you have to anticipate how to create uh, creative or the positive advertising or marketing effort. Not only focus to how to sell your product. But there are so many steps. The next discussion will be conducted by me. But uh, in the first session, I would like to thank you for your attendance for Mr. Uh, Mr. Greek. Okay, applause for the Mr. And I would like to, oh, Mr. Anang, you would like to give him some question. Okay. This economics, he is economics too. 
Thank you. Uh, good evening, Professor Reed. Uh, based on statistics Indonesia, around 96% of business are micro and small scale in Indonesia. Uh, the biggest contributing sector are from uh, trade, wholesale, and retail, and the second one is from uh, manufacturing sector. As the digital economy grows alongside the digital technology, uh, I, keep in, I keep on thinking about the future of manufacturing business in Indonesia. Uh, regarding the topic, I have two questions. The first one is, is manufacturing industry will convergence into only big companies or vice versa uh, that many more smaller manufacturing companies will dominate the, industri the, the manufacturing industry. Uh, if the trend is the second one, I'm worried about their economics of scale and productivity. And the second question, what is the potential of shared manufacturing process uh, among the small scale uh, business by using the digital technology? Thank you. Nice question. Yeah, I don't know that I know, know much about the second question at all about shared platforms for, for production. Um, in terms of the, uh, it's interesting in terms of the first question because you, you hit a, uh, that you, your situation is common throughout the world. And so uh, I, think, I think you're gonna have, a, you're, no, you're not gonna, you, you, in order to take advantage of the digital economy as a as a small company, you're going to have to have an investment in in IT infrastructure and other things, and and probably investment in human capital in order to make that happen. So there'll be some people that do that, and then can enter a little bit into the regular stream of things and compete somewhat with large manufacturers. Um, and then there'll be another part of the economy where they really, that they don't enter into it, the consumers don't particularly enter into it, or are content to uh, frequent a good or service that doesn't enter, it, enter into it either. So, of course, we don't, none of us do all of our buying on digital platforms. Now, we might get information on it through digital platforms. So there'll always be a fringe, and that fringe might be larger in some countries than others. Uh, the fringe might be larger in Indonesia than it is in, in other countries. Uh, but, I, but I really think it's going to be the, the, the barrier is the ability to tailor, to, to meet even the niche products in a much more efficient, cost-effective way. Um, that might not be true, you know, because the people that are involved in all of this, the, the technology, the infrastructure is expensive, and some of the people involved in, 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 in making that infrastructure useful to the company are, are expensive too. So there's probably going to be some room for, for small scale businesses, but I think the, the, the small businesses will miss out more and more. You know, there's a, there's, in the United States, there's the, and I, I referenced this trip to New England, it's as, because a lot of those places in upper New York, you know, when you think of New York, you think of New York City and all, the, all but these are little places. Well, what do they emphasize? They emphasize very fine crafts or very fine foods Vermont, northern Vermont, very fine foods that are organic, that are natural, that have characteristics that the large companies don't, they might have, but, but they are able to, to uh, view, the, have a conversation with the person that produced it and, and all this that, that generates benefits, and at least in a high-income country like mine, 
for things like that, where they know they've bought, purchased it from this person. So buy local. And they don't allow big companies to have restaurants. They don't allow McDonald's in there. They don't allow uh, Starbucks. They don't allow uh, Walmart into those places. So there'll be pockets of that. But, you know, it's, it's a very niche market. And some people are willing to pay for that. Me, I'm not willing to pay for that. Uh, I'm too cheap. <laughs> I, I, uh, you know, I, I don't mind if my milk is non-organic. I don't mind if, uh, if, my, if uh, my coffee cup looks a little more standardized than, than this very beautiful scene. But there are other people that do. Uh, so you've got an income effect. You know, in Indonesia, you're going to have an income effect. So you're going to have this effect that as Indonesia grows, you're going to have people that can pay more for what they really, really want. Is it going to be small businesses that provide that? Or is it going to be large businesses? Uh, my bet is it's probably going to be large businesses. I think it, it will certainly be in the United States. It will be certainly large businesses. Here, maybe so. But I go to Tanzania, too. And in Tanzania, it's going to be a long time. You know, they are, they are far behind Indonesia in what you have. So it's a little bit diff more difficult to call because you really have savvy people out here that can provide it and can demand it too. So, but they can also work in small companies that can use that technology too. I don't know. You know, I'm an economist that, you know, <laughs> we're, we're together. <laughs> okay, thank you. Applause for the answer. And the last session, I would like to invite Mrs. Tami as the head of study program, business administration, to give all some appreciation for you. Okay? Mister, you can stand up. Yes. <laughs> no. This is the first time I've ever lectured without shoes. <laughs> yes, you can. Kalau diabadikan dulu, Bu. Digeser di sini. Okay, thank you Mrs. Tami for inviting Mr. Michael Reed. Okay, some souvenir also. <laughs> okay, next, the last one to take a picture together. You just put here. I would like to invite Mr. Benny, Mr. Anang. You can join Mr. Rijal and also the all of student. Di sini aja. Maju, maju. Boleh geser ini aja yang depan. Mungkin maju. Segaris ini nih, Segaris sofa. Ini nih. Coba, ini nih. di sini. Yang ini biar ke nah, berkepelan. Sini aja, maju sini. Oh, yang ini, Ter depan. Ter ya. <laughs> Adek, boleh? Oh, maju, maju. Sini. Duduk sini. Di sini.
100 a picture. 